What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the world's first cryptocurrency, and it works because of the world's first public blockchain network. What does Bitcoin do? It's simple. It lets you send and receive value to and from anyone in the world using nothing more than a computer and an internet connection. Now, why is it revolutionary? Because unlike every other tool for sending money over the internet, it works without the need to trust a middleman. The lack of any corporation in between means that Bitcoin is the world's first public digital payments infrastructure. And by public, I simply mean available to all and not owned by any single entity. Now, we have public infrastructure for information, for websites, for email, it's called the internet. But the only public payments infrastructure that we have is cash, as in paper money. And it only works in face-to-face -face transactions. Before Bitcoin, if you wanted to pay someone remotely over the phone or the internet, then you could not use public infrastructure. You would rely on a private bank to open their books and add a ledger entry that debits you and credits the person you're paying. And if you both don't use the same bank, well, then there'll be multiple banks and multiple ledger entries in between. What happens on the decentralized internet is decided by the investors versus what happens on the main internet is decided by Twitter, Facebook, Google, and a small number of other companies. Let's say that I'm a miner of Bitcoin, somebody who actually creates Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is the reward I receive for doing the work to keep the network operational. And that allows me to own a piece of the Bitcoin blockchain. With Bitcoin, the ledger is the public blockchain, and anyone can add an entry to that ledger, transferring their Bitcoins to someone else. And anyone, regardless of their nationality, race, religion, gender, sex, or creditworthiness, can for absolutely no cost create a Bitcoin address in order to receive payments digitally. What makes Web3 different is the ability to own the actual network. And that's what crypto assets themselves represent, is an ownership stake in an underlying network. So when you hear people talk about, for example, layer one tokens, what they mean is, this is your reward for providing the ledger maintenance services, the computing power to the network that on web one and two was done by Google. Bitcoin is the world's first globally accessible public money. Is it perfect? No, neither was email when it was invented in 1972. Bitcoin's not the best money on every margin. Uh, it's not yet accepted everywhere. It's not used often to quote prices, and it's not always a stable store of value. But it is working, and the mere fact that it works without trusted intermediaries is amazing. It's a computer science breakthrough, and it will be as significant for freedom, prosperity, and human flourishing as the birth of the internet. And Bitcoin is just the beginning. If we can replace private payments infrastructure, then we can replace other private choke points to human interaction as well. What makes Web3 different is the ability to own the actual network. And that's what crypto assets themselves represent, is an ownership stake in an underlying network. Now, why should we want to build more public infrastructure? Why should we embrace blockchains over corporate intermediaries? Why should we tolerate their inefficiencies and work to make them better? Why should we want the pioneers of this technology here in the United States and not fleeing overseas? A simple reason, because the corporate intermediaries providing today's critical but privately owned infrastructure are becoming fewer, larger, and more powerful, and their failures are incre increasingly grave. So roughly half of all Americans, 143 million people, had their social security numbers exposed to hackers because of a breach at Equifax. The SWIFT network has relayed hundreds of millions of dollars in fraudulent transactions because of hacked member banks in Bangladesh, Vietnam, Ecuador, and Russia. The FBI suspects now that the largest of these hacks was perpetrated by North Korea. Corrupt, low-level employees at an Indian bank, Punjab National, were able to fraudulently certify SWIFT messages stealing $1.8 billion. It's the largest electronic bank robbery in history. In fact, it's the largest bank robbery in history. In October 2016, an estimated 1.2 million internet-connected devices were hacked and turned into a botnet that for several hours made prominent websites unavailable across Europe and North America, including CNN and Fox News, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Increasingly, physical machines are being connected to the internet to augment their capabilities. They're wired through servers that are owned and maintained by private and trusted intermediaries, the so-called Internet of Things.
Pacemakers from St. Jude's Hospital have been hacked. Baby monitors from TrendNet have been hacked. And Jeeps from Jeep have been hacked to the point where they can be remotely commandeered and driven off the road. Now, those vulnerabilities are inescapable in systems that have single points of failure. It doesn't matter if the point of failure is a corporation or if it's a government. There shouldn't be a single point of failure. Similar choke points existed before the internet. If you wanted to deliver a message, you'd have to go through one of three television broadcasters or a handful of newspapers. Private corporations are essential, but no critical infrastructure should rely on one or two. The internet removed single points of failure in communications infrastructure and ushered in a wave of competition among new media corporations building on top of its public rails. Blockchains can similarly disintermediate critical payments and IoT infrastructure. The technology is not yet ready to answer all of those questions today, but it is our best hope. And as with the internet in the 1990s, we need a light touch pro-innovation policy to ensure that these innovations flourish in America for the benefit and security of all Americans. The characteristic of Web1, if people remember their original AOL account, was an ability to look in a curated walled garden at a set of content that was not interactive but was presented to you on AOL the way that Time Magazine used to show you the articles they wanted you to see inside of their magazine. Just you could see it on a screen. The innovation of Web2 was that suddenly you could not only read content, but you could also write content. This is when the blogosphere became a, a big thing. People remember this from the late 90s, the early 2000s. The reason for the centralization of the internet, of course, was that all of that activity was being monetized by a very small number of companies, Facebook, Google, and two or three other companies. So now people in my hometown of Pueblo, Colorado can actually own the Ethereum network. They can't own the internet. That's owned by Google and a few other companies. That's what the project of crypto is all about, is allowing people to directly own the networks that are, have native assets that are supporting it. And that's the nature of decentralization, where the token holders are the people who control the assets. Okay. The concept is that you have sort of application layer tokens and you have protocol layer tokens. So if I'm an owner of Bitcoin, let's say that I'm a miner of Bitcoin, somebody who actually creates Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is the reward I receive for doing the work to keep the network operational. And that allows me to own a piece of the Bitcoin blockchain. Or take Ethereum, which is easier to understand. The Ether token represents an ownership stake in the network, but on top of that network are all kinds of apps that get built on the network, much like the apps on your phone depend on the underlying network existing that lets the phone operate. And so people will make judgments about which network is likely to win, and they will invest in the tokens in that network much the same way you might invest in Google stock because you think Google is gonna scale access to the original internet. The difference being here, you can vote on what happens in the future of a proof of stake network, for example. You can get rewarded through a proof of work token for maintaining a ledger on something like Bitcoin. But the real message here is that what happens on the decentralized internet is decided by the investors versus what happens on the main internet is decided by Twitter, Facebook, Google, and a small number of other companies.